today I am extremely pleased to be speaking to recognised technology expert and award-winning author Phil Simon. Phil consults companies on how to optimise their use of technology and Phil has written five books. These are Too Big to Ignore, The Business Case for Big Data, The Age of the Platform, The New Small, The Next Wave of Technologies and Why New Systems Fail. Phil's contributions have been featured in the most prominent online and offline publications, including Inc. Magazine, NBC, CNBC, The Huffington Post, Forbes, Business Week, The New York Times, and many, many more. Phil also holds degrees from Carnegie Mellon University and Cornell University, and Phil joins us today from his home in Las Vegas. Phil, a very big welcome to you. Tony, thank you for having me. How are you today? Yeah, good, thanks, good, thanks. And... Um, I just wanted to, to just set the scene a little bit, Phil. You, you're obviously you know, a pr prolific uh, thinker and writer uh, on some really you know, cutting-edge topics. So just give us a little bit of um, background about yourself. Tell us a little bit um, about what's led you to where you are today. Well, in hindsight, Tony, I've always had a fascination with technology and data. Unfortunately, I sort of got on the wrong path, off the right path. I started working in corporate human resources after grad school and realized that it probably wasn't the best fit for me. I still believe in the primary importance of people, but people can only do so much. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason we don't use typewriters anymore. So I spent the last 15 years consulting and writing about data, people, business, and technology and how they all kind of come together. So um, at this point, I mostly write and speak. I do a little bit of consulting, but I firmly believe that there are three types of people in the world. There are those who get it, those who don't get it and want to get it, and I can deal with those, but then there's those who don't get it and never want to get it. And I try to avoid those people because those projects don't tend to end very well. The, the so flat through, earthers, I think we call them. Right, right. So through the writing and the speaking, I hopefully can reach people who are, if they're not converts, then they're at least open to new ways of doing things because technology advances faster than ever. There's certainly a downside. You'll never hear me say otherwise. But for the most part, we can be, and I write about this in the new small, incredibly productive with a fraction of the financial and human resources you needed even 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, the productivity side of thing, things. I think sometimes people, they can, they can get a little bit lost with all of the sort of shiny new toys and really forget about how massively more productive people are. And that can, you know, some ways that can be a good thing and a bad thing, I think some people will think. But, you know, just compared with 15 or, or 20 years ago, I think. Sure. There is a um, line to be drawn. In one hand, it's great that you can be reached with your iPhones all the time. Yeah. Uh, if, God forbid, there's an emergency. On the other hand, sometimes you just want to take a break from it all and you don't want to feel tethered to an electronic leash. So um, to me, it's about finding that happy balance. But from a business perspective, you're right. You can be so much more productive. Um, I've never read Tim Ferriss's The 4-Hour Work Week, but I understand the concept. Um, you can certainly work many hours, but working smarter and working harder are not the same thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he he, def he goes for, you know, the sort of 80-20 Pareto's law and, and Parkinson's law about, you know, the, the maximum amount of time or whatever it is will fit the, or work will fit into the time allowed to do the project. So you can achieve things in 24 hours if you've got 24 hours or if you've got a week, you'll take a week to, to do it. So interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, I think in terms of the body of your written work, it covers a very, you know, wide range of important and relevant subjects. But I, I think probably the, the book that would most closely resonate with our readers um, is probably going to be the new small because um, in this book you give a number of examples don't you of small businesses that have really achieved some startling results um, using a selection of new technologies can you tell us a little bit more about your approach and about your findings in that book uh, sure Tony I am first and foremost a small business owner yeah. I run a couple of companies and I am in like to think a pretty productive person. I've written five pretty big books and edited a sixth over the last four years while doing other things. Um, and I knew that I wasn't alone. So I, after I'd written my second book, The Next Wave of Technologies, which is about large enterprises embracing things we'll talk about later like cloud computing and social media and open source software, I said to myself, which small organizations were actually getting things done as well as if not better than large organizations because they weren't encumbered by legacy technologies, by dysfunctional corporate cultures, by uh, processes that didn't make any sense that were dated. And I reached out and found 11 small businesses 
that were doing very interesting things in a wide variety of industries. I didn't want to profile 11 tech companies. I discuss uh, Chef Tony, who's a, a seafood restaurant owner, or a law firm in Minneapolis, or iPad case manufacturer, Dodo case. So after I collated the information, I realized that these companies were using five technologies. I call them the five enablers in the book. Open source, social media, cloud computing, software as a service, and mobility. And while you still need to work hard and have a good business plan, by embracing these very effective technologies that cost a fraction of what they would have 15 years ago, they were actually doing things as small companies that big companies couldn't even do. So that's the book in a nutshell. Excellent. So let's just 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 go back a step there. You've, you've searched for, for um, they're not necessarily large corporate companies. These are the sort of companies that you could find on a local or regional basis. Is that correct? Correct. In, I don't know about the UK, but in the United States, there are 28 million small businesses. For every IBM or Google, you have thousands of companies like mine, right? Very, very small. So um, I'm not saying that I found the 11 best companies, but I was determined to work with companies that embraced this new line of thinking, whether they knew it or not. They were very pragmatic. Uh, they weren't necessarily wedded to um, antiquated ways of doing things. In fact, uh, one of my favorite stories of the book, a woman had started a company 15 years ago and she created her own system. She blew up that system because it no longer made sense. In many large corporate environments, and even with small businesses, people stick with what they know, with what historically has worked. It's very difficult for them to get away from successful ways of doing things. And to me, that describes how most businesses need to act these days. Most people have read, or I should hope, at least heard of Clayton Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma. The same technologies, the same business model that made you successful can bring about your demise. So if you look at companies like Google and some of the ones I discussed in my fourth book, The Age of the Platform, to me, the most successful companies are the ones that are looking at what they're doing now and saying, in a year or two or five or 10, will this still be the way the world works? And if not, don't wait for it to change, proactively change. In the Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson, one of my favorite quotes from Steve Jobs is this, your business is going to be cannibalized. The only question, Tony, is who's going to do it? Is it going to be you or is it going to be your competition? Yeah. So um, I'm a big believer that uh, changes individually aren't permanent, but change is. And, and that's actually a quote from one of my favorite Rush songs. Very good. Now, I mean, that's a very that's a brilliant quote, and and that absolutely summarises it. You know, you've 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 either got to do it yourself, or somebody else is going to do it for you, and and it's better to take control of it yourself. I think what's really interesting, um, Phil, is that you you've said that these these companies they haven't kind of maybe set out with a with a, a grand plan of what they're going to do. They've just realised that you know hey these technologies are here we're going to take hold of them and we're going to we're going to start doing it we're going to kind of make our own rules up is, is that correct to, to, to think that way? I mean just to some extent um, uh, it's very difficult to predict the future right I mean in hindsight Twitter and Facebook make a lot of sense yeah but they weren't the first social networks so there are reasons for those companies being successful um, I'm uh, one of my favorite quotes um, is from Jerry Brown who used to be the governor of California he says Everyone likes to plan because no one has to do anything. Um, I'm a big believer that it's important to have a general idea about where you're going, but where you ultimately wind up, much less how you get there, may be very different. So how can you get your work done and make money and innovate while at the same time being open to new ideas and not becoming ossified? Um, that's why I am fascinated still, even though at my heart I'm a technologist, I always come back to what I studied in grad school because people are making these decisions, right? Ten years ago, Yahoo, MySpace, uh, Microsoft, companies like that were really dominant. Well, these days, Yahoo struggled. MySpace is technically still around and Microsoft is facing major threats. So why did those companies struggle? Well, they had the budgets, they had the technology, but maybe the senior leadership didn't adapt as quickly as they could have. So I'm still very intrigued by this notion of people and technology and how they can help each other, but also how they can potentially uh, conflict. 
But no, nobody can predict the future. That's always been true. I would argue it's equally true today, uh, even in an era of, of big data and predictions. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's, it's always looking out for the next big bend in the road, isn't it? You know, what's it going to be? How can you position yourself? And you say it's interesting that even the biggest companies, as you say, with all their massive marketing and research budgets, you know, some of them, they can't, they can't predict all of, all of these things and see exactly where, it's, where, right. where the next sort of challenge is coming from. Um, yeah, I mean, who predicted the Arab Spring? Yeah. Not exactly, too many. Exactly. Quite. Yeah. Who would Who would have thought? You know. I mean, that uh, you know that these things could happen, and and the sort of the power of these sort of social networks to, to to enable people to communicate and get their stories out. It's it's phenomenal, really, when you think about it. Right. And there's a I think an inherent uh, modesty that you have to have, knowing that we can't eliminate uncertainty and risk, but hopefully we can minimize it. Hopefully we can understand what we're getting into. So if you're launching a new product or service. You know, if there's a one in a million shot, that's probably not worth doing. If there's a one in ten or one in five shot, and the upside justifies it, yeah. then to me, you're making a better business decision. In my most, uh, in my fourth book, The Age of the Platform, I write about how building a platform guarantees nothing, but if you do that, your odds of success are actually quite a bit higher than if you think very provincially and only you don't embrace the outside, the ecosystems, the third-party developers. Yeah. Um just speaking specifically then about the five enablers that you mentioned. So we've got cloud, social technologies, um, SaaS, open source, and um, mobility. Could you yes. just talk us through those individually and just give us some specific examples so that our audience can understand and visualize sure. what, the, what they can potentially do and how they can adapt these um, to okay. their businesses? Well, let's start with cloud computing. It's definitely become a bit of a buzzword, and I can provide a very technical definition but to me, it's much easier to think about what the technology does, not necessarily all the technical specifications behind it. And with cloud computing, you basically have access to your data in your apps as long as you have an internet connection. That could be on a PC or a laptop. It could also be on a tablet or it could be on a smartphone. And there are many companies that embrace the cloud. Netflix, for instance, runs its streaming service through Amazon Web Services, a major cloud provider. There are companies like Rackspace. I'm a big fan of Dropbox. So if I'm at a conference and I need to bring up my email, I run on Gmail, I have my, um, my smartphone, I can take advantage of the cloud. Software as a service is kind of a cousin, Tony, as you know, of the cloud. Companies like Salesforce.com can deploy their software. They don't have to send you a CD. They don't have to send consultants to your home to upgrade your software. And SaaS allows for a much more flexible pricing model. No longer do you have to predict how many users, how many transactions you'll have at the beginning of the year. Again, like I said before, who knows? So companies like Salesforce allow you to pay as you go and not have to even try to predict the future. You don't have a use it or lose it type of environment. 10 years ago, open source software was pretty much the purview of geeks and dark rooms. Now, Many, forget small companies, many large companies are using, whether it's Apache or Linux or WordPress, many open source applications. Firefox, a popular browser, also open source. People can develop extensions of it. You can fork it, create your own version. Uh, next up, mobility. Um, we are constantly connected. No longer do we need to be sitting at our computers to get work done. Apple recently passed 50 billion downloads for the App Store. I think Android, at Google I.O. conference was yesterday, uh, Android announced something like 800,000 apps. So those are four of the enablers, and I think I forgot one. Mobility, open source, cloud. Social technologies. There you go. Um, social technology. I mean, Facebook has 1.1 billion users. Twitter has a $10 billion market capitalization and, and has brought about changes in the way that news is presented. So it's um, very difficult to completely ignore social media. Things can go from anonymous to viral like that. And these days, you know, we're hearing about citizen journalists. Four or five years ago, a, a plane, uh, Captain Sullivan, landed in the uh, Hudson River outside of Manhattan. The people were tweeting about it and posting uh, photos long before proper journalists arrived on scene. So those five technologies, as a general rule, small companies are starting to adapt and they're seeing incredible results. No longer do you have to spend a million dollars on a technology budget. You may spend that much, but it's because you actually need that much. So things are very flexible and 
you no longer have to be a proper techie to make this stuff happen. Um, any, you know, in the U.S., only something like 45% of all small businesses have websites. Wow. To me, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, they're not very expensive and they're not that complicated. You can either spend three or $4,000 or go with a much simpler templated site. But to me, this is a lot different than the dot-com boom. This stuff was more technical to use um, and more expensive. These days, it's not quite WYSIWYG. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to set up a Facebook page. Yeah, no, as you say, I mean, tools like whether it's Salesforce or Infusionsoft or whatever, really very, very powerful tools. And, and a few years ago, these would have been the preserve of just you know, the, the biggest companies. But now th these are accessible to, to, to anybody, to startups or you know, small or medium sized businesses. So. You know, I think you know some some people might be thinking, listening to this, thinking, oh yeah, you know that that sound it sounds good, but it sounds a complex and b expensive. So it, it isn't really the case, is it? I don't think so. I mean, it's all relative. You can certainly spend a tremendous amount of money, and you can build custom applications that become more complicated. But I can be up and running with Salesforce later today if I want. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it will be loaded with accurate data, but. These companies have, in some cases, millions of users. You know, a few uh, about a year ago, Microsoft purchased Yammer, which is kind of like Facebook for the workplace. Now, Yammer grew very quickly from the bottom up. It was very organic. People would embrace the freemium model. They would download it. They would deploy it. People would use it. And once they got to a certain number of users or wanted to unleash a certain uh, feature, you would have to pay. So the freemium model allows many organizations to date before you get married. Fifteen years ago, Tony, as you know, you would have to go through a formal RFP or RFI process, purchase the software, deploy the software, test the software, cross your fingers and hope that it was a success. These days, you can get a little bit pregnant with the cloud. You can try some of these tools very quickly and very inexpensively. And if it doesn't work for whatever reason, in fact, a couple of the companies in the new small did this, for whatever reason, the particular application, let's say it was NetSuite, didn't take. You're talking about maybe wasting a week and a little bit of money. That's a lot different than in my first book, companies that spent millions of dollars on an application and wound up in court two years later. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, you've, you've got some great examples in the book. What's your favorite one? Which is the most powerful one that, that can give people a real feel for how you can pull all of this together? At the risk of disrespecting the other 10, uh, Chef Tony, who runs the seafood restaurant in Maryland, has my favorite quote in the whole book. He said, there are two parts of my brain, food and technology, and I'm constantly thinking about how you fuse the two together. So when a guy running a restaurant can have a very active social media presence, run a podcast, have a very professional website. You know, what's the excuse for someone in a proper office whose company doesn't do any of those things? Exactly. I mean, in 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 my in our book that we wrote, the the lazy website syndrome, we give an example. You know, we just sort of made up an, an example just to illustrate what what you could do. And we use a restaurant owner, and we said, look, you know, imagine if he just starts off with something basic, maybe putting his recipes out there. Um, and then he can he can take it from there. He can start to communicate with people. He can have fun evenings. He can have cooking cookery classes. He can show his favorite how he cooks his favorite dish. He can have wine tasting evenings. All sorts of things like this. And he can he can sort of build a ring fence around his faithful customers. Then they'll love sure. him for it. Aside from generating content by being active on the web, you can do some other amazing things. In the book, I call it customer rescue. Chef Tony about four years ago had his Google alert pick up a negative review on his restaurant. And obviously that happens all the time with, with Yelp or with Google Places. So Tony read the blog review, contacted the writer, began a discussion, brought the guy back in, apologized for the experience. The guy amended his online review. So he turned a detractor into an advocate. Think about that. Yeah. 15, 20 years ago, if somebody had a bad experience, they might tell their friends. In fact, they used to work in customer service uh, almost 20 years ago now, and they said that the average angry customer told 60 people. That's right. That was before email, before websites and social media. So today, if you had a bad, and we've all heard the story of United Breaks Guitars, yep. right? Or where Comcast sucks. So there have been plenty of highly publicized social media debacles. 
My point is that you can't stop them from happening, but you can conceivably reach out to somebody who had a bad experience and at least understand why, if, if not make that right. To me, that's an incredibly powerful tool if you use it. Exactly. And, and this is the point, isn't it? That people sometimes can, when they think about all of these different technologies, that they just think maybe, look, I don't sell online. Why do I need a website? Or why do I need to do this? But that's not the point, is it? As you've just illustrated there, there's, there's, there's an incredible array, array of different possibilities. Um, if you just use your imagination, it, you don't have to just think, oh, my website is there purely to sell or to be like a business card. You can use it you know, to generate leads, to develop relationships with people. And then you know, if you, with social media, it's really powerful if you can you know, take it offline as well as sure. online. And, uh, particularly with something like a restaurant, you, you have a much better opportunity to do that. Right. And not just your website, but other websites. If you ran a restaurant, why wouldn't you want to pay attention to Yelp? Yeah. Right? Why wouldn't you want a Facebook page or a Twitter handle? Even if most of your clients or customers weren't on Twitter, you may be searching or buy an ad on a promoted tweet on Twitter, and you go, wow, we're actually in Las Vegas, and we're in the mood for sushi. So there are all sorts of ways that, in fact, I actually picked up a new client a few days ago, and one of my standard questions is, how do you find out about me? And the person said, well, I, I Googled you and found a series of articles you wrote on this particular subject. So it isn't just about your website, and I'll come back to that in a minute. It's about what Chris Brogan calls using outposts, being present on other networks or platforms. I actually don't even think of my own website as a website. I run WordPress, which is a content management system. The whole point of my site is not to set it and forget it, it's to keep you coming back because I have something interesting to say. I'm doing an interview with a smart bloke, present company, um, or I'm um, speaking at a conference or someone heard of, was doing research. You know, people, I don't even think of marketing in terms of you know, pushing things to people. I want them to come to my site because I have interesting content. Yeah. And if you don't have a website, then you're making it very difficult, but even if you just have a website, it behooves you to populate that website with interesting content on a regular basis. Excellent. Now, at, at the risk of sort of asking you to tempt fate, you know, I know you said you know you're not you, you can't predict the future, but where, where do you see things going? I mean, mobiles m mobile is increasingly important, isn't it? And it needs to be part of people's strategy. And I'm always saying that is that the next sort of big thing? Do you think, or, or is it the big, next big thing now? Right. Well, mo mobility is already here. We're going to see more wearable technology, things like Google Glass, things like Fitbit. Uh, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book, The Singularity is Near. He believes that man will be fused with, with machine by 2045. And we only have about 2 billion people connected to the web out of 7 billion people on the planet. Over the next 5 to 10 years, with smartphones dropping in prices and apps exploding and broadband becoming more available, we're going to see an even bigger explosion. Uh, I wrote my new book, Too Big to Ignore the Business Case for Big Data, because we're generating more and more data. So that data will be used to better um, predict what will happen, even though it won't be perfect. But I have no crystal ball. Uh, we'll see things like augmented reality and a whole bunch of other things, you know, drones now. Uh, it's, it's interesting and it's scary. I think the good outweighs the bad, but there certainly are downsides uh, with regard to big data, we're talking about privacy and security. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, have you put your order in for your Google Glass yet, for the uh, for the glasses yet? No, I am. Um, I'm an early adopter in general, but uh, uh, <laughs> I, so I want to see a, a little bit. I mean, I, I think the, the applications potentially for EMTs or medical professionals or uh, soldiers yeah. are, are fantastic. I, I don't necessarily uh, know that I'll be the first person who will have Google Glass but um, you have to pay attention to it. Google's not the only company working on eyeglasses. A rumor has it that Samsung and Apple are thinking about that too, and Microsoft. Phil, thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, great, um, great content, great information for our, um, for our audience. So if people want to find out a little bit more about you, where can they go to? PhilSimon.com. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. And um, as I say, there's some really good points in there for, for, our, for our audience. I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll take, take those on board. Uh, and thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Tony. Cheers.